Welcome to the Jostowski Castle Center for Contemporary Art, um, our Culture Tensions program, co curated by myself and Agnieszka um, Kolek. Um, uh, so this is a very um, pertinent um, discussion. We know what's going on, it's on the news all the time. Um, so we are going to be discussing um, uh, from an artistic perspective uh, about 7.10 of the 7th of October 2023 and the aftermath um, uh, after that date, but also about cultural semitism, uh, cultural anti-semitism, excuse me. Um, so we hope that um, we will give you food for thought. Um, I know there's a lot of, um, a lot of discussions on social media uh, in the news. Um, but one thing that we don't hear um, are Israeli artists um, and what their personal perspective or point of view is and how they respond to what happened in the last four months ago um, via art uh, as their practice. On my right here is Maya Amrami. Uh, Maya um, is Israeli and uh, lives in London. Uh, she's a multidisciplinary artist and also a doctoral student at the University of the Arts London uh, at the C London College of Communications. She holds an MA in Fine Arts Printmaking from Middlesex University and a BA in Fashion Design from Schenker College of Engineering and Design in Tel Aviv. In recent years, Maya has dedicated her efforts to her doctoral project, blending academic writing and artistic praxis to create golem self-portraits on Instagram. These golems have been showcased in various academic conferences and exhibitions across the, the UK. Following the events of the 7th of October, Maya's golem works have taken on, an, taken on an unexpected turn, which she'll be exploring through her presentation. Um, Mark Provisor, um, our second guest speaker, uh, was born in Philadelphia, USA. In 1982, he became an Israeli, sh an Israeli sh soldier, forgive me, uh, fighting against terrorists in Lebanon. He studied fine art in 1985 at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Mark took a break from the arts world in the 1990s and returned to counter-terror security. The situations he found himself in were so overwhelming that he was unable to paint. They were too painful to express via art. He returned to art in 2019, his subject matter diversified, taking a different turn to convey his experience of fighting terror and preventing violence. Since 2020, he has exhibited in several exhibitions and presenting talks on art in the shadow of terror. He works in exhibits in both the USA and in Israel. And my co-curator, Agnieszka Kolek, um, is an artist, curator, and co-founder of the Passion for Freedom Art Festival. Through supporting artists forbidden to exhibit their art, she exposes the silence of many and challenges the comfortable position of those who inhabit safe spaces. Agnieszka survived the terror attack in Copenhagen in 2015. She continued the meeting on art and blasphemy after the attack by saying, they not only want to kill us, they want to stop us talking, so we should continue. I think that's a pertinent uh, way to end my introductions to our speakers. So um, without further um, uh, ado, um, I will introduce Agnieszka to be our, our first presenter. Thank you, please give her a round of applause. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have to admit that I found it very difficult for, to prepare for this discussion. And I think that the main reason has been um, the feeling of revulsion um, when thinking of the atrocities committed on the 7th of October 2023 by Hamas in the southern Israel and even greater revulsion at the subsequent celebrations that took place in Gaza and the Western capital cities like in New York, Sydney, and London. So these are images taken in Times Square in New York um, on the 8th of October, 2023. Uh, they show the celebrations of the attack on Israel. 
Several hundred uh, pro-Palestinian demonstrators rallied in Times Square, waving Palestinian flags and chanting, resistance is justified, globalize the Intifada, and smash the settler Zionist state, and from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Among the pro-Palestinian side, the mood was celebratory and spiteful. Demonstrators chanted 700, referring to the confirmed number of Israeli fatalities counted so far. Since then, we know that it's been a double number. And held up the number seven on their hands while making throat slitting gestures. Others flashed victory signs with their hands while shouting insults. The images you have seen and the chants I have quoted are good examples of the red-green alliance which Asra Nomani also calls woke army. So uh, she describes uh, this woke army and the mechanics in her uh, book published at the beginning of 2023 of the same title. Her book uh, being published at that time uh, can tell us that by the end of that year, 2023, we could all see wide in the open the threat that we are facing. Nomani, in her book, uncovers an unholy alliance between radical Muslims who preach jihad against Western freedoms and far-left activists whose divisive ideology turns all of the society's issues into a race war. The shock troops of this dangerous red-green alliance work in tandem using harassment, threats, and bullying to silence critics, and labeling those who speak out as Islamophobic or racists. Now, the matter of our discussion is artists and arts. Are artists and the art institutions part of this alliance? No, not all of them. Actually, some might argue that they are a minority, but loud and dangerous, but minority. Manik mentioned in, uh, the, in his text on the website advertising our event, uh, the open letter published on the 19th of October by the Art Forum's editor-in-chief, David Velasco. Now I will be quoting some parts of it. Uh, so it's been an open letter from the art community to cultural organizations with 8,000 signatories from the art world. Now quote, we support Palestinian liberation and call for an end to the killing and harming of all civilians and immediate ceasefire, the passage of humanitarian aid into Gaza and the end of the complicity of our governing bodies in grave human rights violations and war crimes. We demand that the institutional silence around the ongoing humanitarian crisis that 2.3 million Palestinians are facing in the occupied and besieged Gaza Strip be broken immediately. And the letter goes on. It continues in similar fashion, with no mention of Hamas attack on the southern Israel on the 7th of October. No mention of the torture of the victims. No mention of the bestial murders, the rapes, the victims burned beyond recognition. Not a word about the kidnapped hostages, men, women, and children. Not a word about the dead bodies being paraded on the streets of Gaza um, so that they could be spat on. On the 23rd of October, this passage was added, probably through the greeted tree, thief. And here I'm quoting the passage added to this open letter. Quote, update, October 23. While we cannot uh, recirculate the petition to all 8,000 signatories, we, the group that authored the petition, as well as a number of the signatories uh, who have reached out in recent days, would like to repeat that we reject violence against all civilians regardless of, regardless of the identity and share revulsion at the horrific massacres of 1,400 people in Israel conducted by Hamas on October 7th. We mourn all civilian casualties. We hope for the expeditious release of all hostages and continue to call for an immediate ceasefire. Now, why does it not seem genuine to me? When in November 2017, Velasco became the editor-in-chief of Art Forum, a new era of Art Forum emerged under his leadership. In his first issue, Velasco wrote a statement, quote, the art world is misogynist. Art history is misogynist. Also racist, classist, transphobic, ableist, homophobic. I will not accept this. Intersectional feminism is an ethics near and dear to so many of our staff, our writers too. This is where we stand. There is so much to be done. Now we get to work." End of quote. 
Now, this is the first warning sign that can explain why the atrocities committed by Hamas were not mentioned in the original letter and were only included later, either due to external pressure or due to the uneasiness that it does not look good in the light of images and witness and first responders' accounts coming out after the 7th of October. Some of our guests in the audience might not be familiar with intersectional feminism. To explain it in the simplest manner possible, um, intersectional feminism draws on far-left ideologies. It started as a sociological theory describing multiply threats of discrimination when identities overlap with a number of minority classes, such as race, gender, age, ethnicity, and the like. This theory, been developed by Kimberly Crenshaw in her 1989 essay and refined in 1991. It is in fact a minority ideological Marxist-Leninist view dominated by people from an economically privileged class who have had a university education in the social sciences or the necessary leisure time and education to study intersectionality, critical race theory, queer theory, and critical analysis of ableism. What does it have to do with Israel and Palestine, and why it should matter? Over the years, it has metastasized into almost every corner of the non-scientific academic world. Without trying to find out peaceful, satisfactory solutions, intersectionality has migrated from feminism into a deep revulsion and hatred against white, male, and especially Jew Jewish Christian traditions with the aim to destroy Western society. The theory of intersectionality is dogmatic orthodoxy that has nothing to do with reality, rather it has all the negative hallmarks of fundamentalist religion. On the surface, it might look like an extreme version of political correctness. Deep down, it is much more dangerous and dark. Instead of including, it excludes. Those of different opinions from the dogma are derided, ridiculed, threatened, and excluded with the help of an online mob that gathering momentum gets to the point of cancellation of those that they disagree with. Cancellation here means total removal from the public life, loss of employment, public shaming, to ensure new employment in the same profession might not be possible. Over the years, I noticed that those of a minority background, for example, women from ethnic minorities, who might have done well entering the so-called oppression Olympics and refused to do so, are treated the worst. And not all victims are equal either. Since 2015, when I survived the terror attack, I have not yet met one social justice warrior preoccupied with victims of terror attacks. But I met many who are the first ones to cry racism and Islamophobia if someone questions where religion meets politics and what comes out of that cocktail. So much for the love and understanding from those who claim to be awake about the social injustices in our societies. As with dogmas and fundamental beliefs, it simplifies all complex issues into oppressed versus oppressors. It suspends all questioning and any form of nuisance. nuance. Leaving ideology aside, I will take a risk and claim that the open letters like that serve more those who write them than help in any tangible way. And if they were to attempt to help, they should have addressed Hamas too, and address it directly. They could have called for the release of the hostages held in Gaza. They could have asked to stop funneling money into constructing complex terror tunnels with EU and American taxpayers' money with the view of mounting new attacks on Israel. Finally, maybe they would have deman demanded that killing stops and people work together. But I doubt it was their aim. Even the main reason behind this letter was to feel good, to be on the right side of history, a sort of performative action, or something more sinister altogether. It was a way to actively contribute to the demise of the democratic state of Israel with a view that ensuing chaos would help to tear down the sexist, homophobic, classist, ableist Western hegemony. Leaving the letter aside, we might wish to look at the whole artwork in a broader perspective and also over time, um, how um, it's being um, affected. Um, now, I would like to show you um, work of an Israeli artist. Um, her name is Rotem Kodish, 
And this I find is a really immediate response from, from an artist straight from her heart, um, observing the, um, the trauma that the war causes uh, to the society. So here's uh, one of her works. She's also working on uh, limited edition books at the moment. And here it relates to the um, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder uh, following the, the rapes, the kidnappings, um, everything that uh, Israelis experience on the 7th of October. So I would question the response from, from the artists and, and the cultural institutions, um, how much actually there is a, an interest in, um, in being involved in real help and real uh, way of creating a dialogue, or actually it's a one-sided attack and actually using this um, situation to their own uh, advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> I'll pass you on to Maya now. Yes, it is. <laughs> Hi, thank you um, for the ones who came. Uh, from the onset of Hamas attack on Israel on October 7, <clears throat> my practice and subsequently my research interest took an unplanned shift. That day, footage appeared on Instagram that will be forever engraved in my memory and which triggered personal and collective traumas as a woman and as a Jewish person. On October 7th, women, men, the elderly and children in the thousands were infiltrated, whole families and individuals at their most vulnerable state. The footage that was quickly recovered from Hamas Telegram account showed mass killing, raping, and beheading, and was shared on Instagram at approximately noontime. I was one of the first people to see the explicit footage and share it on my Instagram live stories. I also took to my Facebook account, which was inactive for the past three years, and deactivated it. My Instagram account, um, previously dedicated, uh, okay. Previously dedicated only to my art and research exploration, had transformed into an activist platform. I was navigating a digital existence, Jewish and non Jewish posts and thoughts, shared news, testimonials, images, memes, illustrations, and articles relating to the sexual violence against rape victims, most of them dead misrepresentation of Jewish people in the media, and surging instances of anti-Semitism. Approximately a month and a half into the war, I found myself compelled to write a message on a WhatsApp Jewish support group I had joined shortly after the events of October 7th unfolded. My distress was palpable. Articulating my feelings through words helped me process the trauma and the dissonance between my physical existence as a mother, artist, and doctoral student, and my mental state plagued by trauma, intrusive thoughts, and an overwhelming sense of vulnerability among others. This text was originally written in response to one of the group's members asking to share the horrific videos from the day with a friend. I've seen 90% of the videos that today consist of the Israel Defense Force documentary footage compilation of Hamas body cams and mobile footage document documenting their atrocities on October 7th. Parts of this video emerged on the first week when the war started. It was shocking to the point I couldn't eat for two weeks, I actually lost weight, and couldn't sleep much as well. It is extremely hardcore. As time passes, the traumatic scenes creep in slowly until one day I realize that these despicable and torturing mental images have penetrated every layer of my consciousness and are engraved in my memory. So now, after one and a half months, I'm finding it hard to go on about daily life as normal, to watch movies or TV or even go to the theater. 
I find it hard to be among many people as I am constantly aware things have a potential to go completely wrong at any point in time. I think that is the post-traumatic combination of seeing the films and watching the unfolding of the mobs in protests. Anything with violence repulses me. If I see a shovel, I remember these images. Also, when I see a kitchen or a balaclava or knives or guns, or when I hear the words Allah Akbar, or when I see people spitting. And this is before we even started getting into the graphic images of rape and or testimonials of people in text. I really suggest considering watching this footage very seriously for your friend. I will never be able to unsee it and I will never be able to return to the state of mind I was in before. Not yet. This text represented a turning point in my artistic journey. Up until then, I had used Instagram and other mobile applications as tools to create golem self-portraits. Yeah. My doctoral research explores self-portraiture on Instagram as golems, transient entities that keep changing, changing and can sometimes lose control. This was my um, first, well, it's not my first golem, but it was my first golem in the research. I'll get back to that shortly. Um, you can. I use the legend of the golem as a framework to examine self-portraiture on Instagram. The story of the golem originates in Jewish folklore and is believed to have inspired Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as well as 20th century literature, film, and the arts. The legend features a rabbi who fashions a being out of earth, bestowing life on the creature using a code, a word that brings it to life in which a removal of one, of, of one letter makes it dead. The rabbi created the golem to protect the Jewish community of Prague from hate attacks. Yet the life-saving golem changes its nature and turns dangerous. Worse than that, it rises against the rabbi, its creator. This narrative represents the complex dynamics of power and authority and sheds light on what can be perceived as a master-slave relationship. The golem of Prague, an assemblage made from earth, possesses immense physical strength when it's brought to life. It is a savior turned destroyer, loved turned hated, continuously shape-shifting a transient entity, reminiscent of the historical spectra of Jewish identity. The narrative of the story as a creative and symbolic text is entangled with the broader historical context of Jewish prosecution and demonization of Jewish people and other minorities existing on the fringes of societal norms, much like individuals who are othered, different, marginalized. Within the golem story lies a poignant reflection of its Jewish identity. Yet unlike its unfortunate fate entrenched in unprovoked conflict, in my work the golem emerges as a powerful and generative framework for my own research. One that illuminates the intricate interplay of power dynamics, creativity and identity. Being Jewish and Israeli has become increasingly racial on social media platforms, a realization I did not have during the initial phase of my doctoral studies. Back in 1956, Erwin Goffman wrote a book called The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life, asserting that people present their self differently in various social situations. On Instagram, self-portraits, like golems, are constructed entities that constantly change. These golems, self-portraits, are presented to the community through a collaboration of humans and codes, creativity and transformation technologies, and communicate with each other, human and bots, through images and text. As my practice always led my research, I embarked on this journey by creating the first textile golem. That was back in February 2019. You can keep scrolling. The golem named Golemka Gigi Frankenstein was composed of an assemblage of selfies, prints, fabrics, paint, and thread, a collage brought to digital life through her Instagram profile. 
Yeah, you can go another one, that's it. In the physical world where I took photographs for her Instagram profile, she was operated by a body dancer, exhibited to the world in conferences and exhibitions, and shared on a dedicated Instagram profile called Golemka Gigi Frankenstein. This experimental endeavor allowed me to explore the complexities of my own identity, identity and in retrospect, gain insights into what it means to be an Israeli and a Jew in the context of Instagram today, a space I now realize is imbued with political overtones. Yeah. My golem self-portrait Gigi resembles the name of Gigi Hadid, a model and TV personality who uses her voice and fame to speak against Jewish and Israeli people. Within this artistic exploration, my golem self-portrait Gigi emerges as a manifestation of the split subject, a concept coined by the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. My relationship with Gigi embodies this duality. I am both her creator and admirer, yet simultaneously the object of her disdain. This duality is evident in the way Gigi deflects self-destructive tendencies uttering derogatory phrases like bitch, unsuccessful artist, and bad mother towards me on her Instagram account. Fast forward to October 7, in the ensuing days, I kept posting mainly on my live feed. Yet on October 12, I began sharing on my main feed. To my surprise, my account started to garner significant views despite losing 2,000 followers since the beginning of the war. I was less concerned about the likes and more focused on ensuring that people saw and understand, understood the plight of Israelis and the experience of Jews in the diaspora. Little did I know that my account, which is by no means big, led to targeted abuse, particularly from a group of Indonesians who formed a digital vigilante army. They blacklisted me, leading to a barrage of vile, racist hate in thousands of comments. Turning this negativity into a constructive force, I initiated a project using an AI phone application. Inspired by an original self-image taken in my car, these AI-generated self-portraits were crafted as intricate assemblages using the abusive texts I received, each hateful comment transformed into an image. My engagement with pro-Jewish content and my assertion of my Jewish and Israeli identity on social media platforms brought to light the fact that I too possess a distinct identity in this digital landscape. Lauren Fournier highlights Adrian Piper's practice an artist, philosopher, and activist as one of the early pioneers in the realm of selfies, employing autobiographical documentation processes combined with her criticism towards philosophical theories. Many of Piper's works explore issues of racial and gender identity, discrimination, and the unique experience of being a black woman in America in the 70s. Her art often encourages viewers to confront their own biases and assumptions. Such work is my calling card one and two, 1986. In this artwork, Piper created a series of business cards that she handed out to people who made racist or offensive comments in her presence. The cards contain text explaining her response to the comment and her intentions to challenge such behavior. Much like Adrian Piper's confrontational response to offensive comments, my AI-generated self-portraits serve as a bold statement to those who harbor hostility towards my race. The work, Bitch from Hell, represents a circle. I was called a bitch when my golem Gigi started communicated with me, communicating with me. Later, I was called a bitch by the Indonesian vigilante army. And now, in this portrait, I am finally materialized as one. Jane Bennett, a philosopher and political theorist, introduces the concept of assemblage, envisioning a world composed of dynamic networks connecting various elements, whether human or non-human. These networks come together to shape complex, ever-changing wholes, and their interactions give rise to emergent effects. 
In this context, Bennett's assemblage concept is embodied through my own Golem AI-generated self-portraits, vibrant living entities where words saturated with negativity and hate become potent forces shaping, shaping each artwork. The AI, in its interpretation of these comments, generated arresting yet unsettling self-portraits, where the images created are explicitly linked to the abusive language used in the comments. My intention is to further engage with these works by printing them out on fabric and making these into three-dimensional soft sculptures. According to the golem story, the code employed by the rabbi to animate the golem is the Hebrew word emet, truth, inscribed upon its forehead. By removing a single letter and shortening the word to met, meaning death in Hebrew, the golem is rendered dead. The narrative of the golem story serves as a powerful reminder of the transformative potency of codes or words within a linguistic structure. It highlights their ability to bestow life or extinguish it, fundamentally altering the state of being from an animate to animate. Edgar Gomez Cruz and Helen Thornham, both digital anthropologists, assert that in the realm of Instagram, algorithms assume the role of codes and language, embodying the tangible manifestations of power relations, negotiations, and design emerging from the interplay between human inter interactions and technology, they shape and govern the dynamics of the platform, exerting influence over the visibility and dissemination of content. In my latest project, hateful comments are transformed into visual representations through AI, illustrating how words and language can be harnessed to create something new and meaningful much like the golem story where the alteration of a single letter in a word changes the state of being from an animate to animate. My project modifies the meaning and impact of hateful words, turning them into a different form of expression. The French philosopher Giles Deleuze wrote about Francis Bacon, and I quote, it is a mistake to think that the painter works on a white surface. He does not paint in order to reproduce on the canvas an object functioning as a model. He paints on images that are already there. Whether expressed through painting or another medium, the canvas surface or digital space is never blank and is always infused with pre-existing images or ideas. These images, whether tangible or virtual, are inherent to the canvas, forming a complex web of visual stimuli that predates my artistic intervention. In Hebrew, the word golem, rooted in the word gelem, refers to raw material. Gelem material encompasses any minor or basic material that generates objects or ideas. It can encompass natural or synthetic material, whether real or metaphorical. My AI-generated golem self-portrait making is an experience that exists prior to execution. The gelem materials are already there, information unraveling alongside my internal and external realities, shaped by myself and others, and others' perceptions of me. Writing about Francis Bacon's work, Deleuze discusses the idea that art, whether it's painting, music, or any other form, is not merely about reproducing existing forms or inventing new ones. Instead, it revolves around capturing forces that aren't inherently visible. <clears throat> Paul Klee's statement, not to render the visible, but to render visible, underscores this concept. The goal is to make these invisible forces perceptible through art. The relationship between my own physical body as the initial image given to AI, the hate texts representing how others perceive me, and the AI as a type of consciousness da database that extracts certain images, embodies an exploration of art and identity in the digital age that is making invisible forces visible through artworks. My body as the starting point represents my physical self and identity. When combined with hate texts that reflect others' perceptions, it becomes a complex interplay between self-identity and external judgments. These texts are not just words. They carry the weight of societal bias, discrimination, and prejudice. 
To borrow from Judith Butler, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Similarly, one is not born, but rather becomes Jewish or Israeli. John Suller writes about self-portraits, stating that they reflect or mirror complexities across different planes of existence at a deep philosophical and psychological level of analysis. The hate words and comments that I transform into AI-generated self-portraits are part of my own and others' complex digital landscape, acting as shape-shifting golems in the making, effectively generating golems formed differently every time others perceive me in a certain way. Through these words, through these works, I am not painting on a blank canvas. On Instagram, I am already politicized and forced to engage with the givens, language, codes, algorithms, as well as emotions, opinions, and expressions, both positive and negative. The AI, in turn, acts as an intermediary, tr intermediary translating these hate texts and my body into a new form of expression. In essence, my artworks, as controversial as they might seem, are testimony to the multifaceted nature of identity in the digital space of Instagram. There are many questions arising from these new angles of perception, yet what is certain now is that these works illustrate how perception and biases can shape our self-identity and how technology can be harnessed to render these intricate forces visible through art. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maya. Please give her a round of applause. We'll pass you on to Mark Provisor now. I guess the first time I actually tried to express myself via art was as a young soldier in the IDF fighting in Lebanon in 1982. It seemed the only way that I could express the chaos of war that I had been experiencing. And that starts my path becoming an artist. We fast forward a number of years. My paintings became focused on many subjects. I fell in love with colors, flowers, landscapes. And so I continued to express myself through my art. Moved to New York City after my service for a few years, and I started studying at the School of Visual Arts and studied under various teachers. I returned to Israel at the onset of the Iraqi war. I continued to paint, and eventually found myself working in the security world focusing on prevention of terror. I have always hated violence. During the Intifada, I guess we could move forward on that, during the Intifada or the Oslo War, uprising or whatever label you choose, I found myself dealing with acts of terror daily. Almost every type of nightmare one could not imagine. My paintings took on a darker palette and subject matter. Terror is political. That's the way it is. And the terror incidents that I was experiencing were being committed by a very particular mindset and demographic. And it was directed against me, though not personal, but against something that I represented to the attackers. I watched and I observed the basis of these attacks, the targets being unarmed, no discretion, men, women, and children of all ages. The paintings grew darker, as did my innermost thoughts. And I remember one particular incident where a man and woman were murdered the terrorist made sure that the man was killed by firing point blank into his head, and an eerie silhouette of the map of Israel blown into his forehead. The woman who was murdered was still clutching her crying infant, and that incident seemed to be the one, might want to go forward to it, the one on the top. I painted it, but I couldn't face my inner beast or release the images that I needed to. It was the last painting that I made actually for years to come. When one experiences that amount of terror that I have, the whole concept of life changes. Time and moments become more meaningful and ultra real. If not only in that moment, you only live once. It takes on a new meeting, and indeed, there are plenty of artists that portrayed this, myself included. You would not never see a political hint in my work, simply a glimpse into the violence. The simple fact is that the unadulterated, unadulterated violence trumped everything else. The fact that this terror I was experiencing was ignited and executed by Muslim Arabs seemed secondary, but then perhaps I was being naive, as the media world found no problem presenting my side as the evil ones. 
I became more sensitive to artwork presented regarding violence and noticed the censoring trends emerging. And especially as a Jew living in what was considered my historical homeland, I was labeled and even discriminated against. Art no longer had anything to do with art. My freedom to work as an artist was now being limited and manipulated by those higher beings who claimed to be the righteous new order of the civilized world. I was watching the freedom that I felt as an artist being curbed and directed, something that I had thought art was beyond. It has only been recently that I decided to further express myself without regard to the political whims of those supreme beings limiting our freedom as artists. I take it as a partial mission, as if those beings who were suppressing the freedom of expressing perhaps an opinion or feeling that differs from the mainstream, who have become the terror as the, of the art world. And as someone who has been actively involved in saving lives, all lives, and actively involved in preventing terror, it is a time that artists should be able to express that terror, the faces behind it, no matter whose faces belong to, without the fear of being either targeted, boycotted, or shunned. Is it political? <laughs> the term political art has always bothered me. For me, I create art in order to express myself. Whether it's a feeling, a reaction, an expression, it's a personal conversation between myself and the canvas or creation that I work on. And of course, art is and has been used as a vehicle to further causes, movements, religions. It's a vehicle that transcends the standard world. It has the power to reach deep inside one's soul, one's intellect. It is precisely for this reason that art has been used as a tool. Wikipedia likes to quote that a strong relationship between the arts and politics, particularly between various kinds of art and power, occurs across historical epics and cultures. And as they respond to the count, contemporary events in politics, the arts take on political as well as social dimensions, becoming themselves a focus of controversy and even a force of political as well as social change. Many of my works in the category of art and terror simply reflect the reality in which I live, in which I work, because I live in what many consider a contested area and have chosen a position which differs from others considered progressive or mainstream, or a number of other labels. Some of my works may be considered political and not in a good way, according to the reigning powers that be. The term political reflects on politics, and yes, there are many works of art that address politics, politicians, particular movements. My art does neither. I address a situation, a reality. The situation slash reality may be one of the results of politics, politicians, or policies, but I do not paint that. We all live in the shadow of politics unless we find ourselves on a deserted island in the midst of Eden. And when I express myself in the shadow of terror, I'm showing what I see what I feel. Yes, I'm showing my side. And why shouldn't I? Shouldn't I be free to do so? Isn't that what freedom of expression is about? The fact that the terror I experience is perpetrated by particular individuals belonging to a particular religion or movement and that I present that I should make my work taboo in the progressive mainstream? I've heard that terror, the terror that I'm talking about is a result of my side. And I can respect that opinion, and I do. And I'm willing to engage in that conversation and have. I've sat with those that are considered terrorists or freedom fighters, whichever label you choose. We've acknowledged and respected our differences, our points of views, while passing each other cups of coffee, our weapons resting on the ground at our sides. We've engaged in conversation, the real one, not the conversation mutated by the spectators of the arena. We've engaged the abstract. And if that particular genre art of mine is deemed political, so be it. If it is not accepted by the mainstream, so be it. But the opportunity to show it is a true effort of that freedom of expression for which I am grateful. For it is not demonizing, just showing a reality that many choose to ignore rather than withdrawing to the supposed safe space. I look at the, at the process of the creation of art as a conversation. Many, most of my, uh, as a conversation, and most of my conversations take place on a two-dimensional surface. I usually set in front of me, colors, paints, brushes, take the place of words in the dialogue and starts and continues in an attempt to draw a conclusion, to arrive at an agreement, to attain a truth. I try to give the viewer a glimpse through my unique lens to envision what I see and experience and how I feel about the living beauty, the chaos, the passion, fragility, and the inherent strength of a people and land. 
It's all just a composition waiting to be played out. And I try to look for the positive and negative spaces of the situation, the light and the dark, the form or lack of, and the heated and chilled sides of the challenges that are set before me. My palette's always changing, developing. It's adapting to the canvas or the conversation that I set before myself. My medium is never set in stone, adjusting itself to this vision. It needs to achieve this goal. I take pleasure in experimenting with mediums and seeking out new adventures. My mentor once asked me to describe a painting of mine. I started explaining, describing, discussing, and he became upset with me. And he said, are you a philosopher or a painter? Use three words or less to describe your work. I love color, I love form, I love paint. That's the way I speak from the inside. A poem I once read by Mary Kate James. The artist, time stands still, lost in the moment of experience, feeling it in his mind, his body, a prayer of rhythm and grace. Hands performs, touching, stroking, following like a dancer to the music in his mind. He lives it, this meditation, this vision, breathing light, color, he is at one in creation. And we live in a wonderful, crazy, insane world filled with beauty and chaos, love and angst, passion and terror, and so much more. Art is my inner truth. It's the way I connect the dots, and I do it because I have to. I need to, and I love it. October 7th, everything changes. I start receiving notices about 6.30 a.m. about a rocket attack down south, and my first reaction is to call my oldest son, who I know is at, was at some party down south, the Nova party. And the call goes like this. Where are you? Don't worry, Abba, we took cover. We've been through rocket attacks before. My son, Abba, I'm hearing shots. Are you armed? No, I see guys coming, out of, out of, out at us, coming at us from the trees. I said, get out of there. Get to Reim or Alumim. My son responded, I've got to move, I'll call you back soon. And then the cell service stops, and I can't get him back on the phone. My heart drops. I get my gear and start heading towards the south. After a while, I hear back from him that he's out of the zone. He didn't listen to me, thank God. Those communities were attacked. He managed to drive out through the fields, and because he took first, first took cover, he didn't drive into the ambush that the terrorists set up on the road. My son survived. My son survived and time stopped for the next few months. I was set to open a new studio in New York City October 11th and to delve fully into my art, reoccurring dream that I was about to manifest. But this date and the Jewish holiday which occurred that day will always remain in my soul as a blackness, a present day witness to the atrocities and horrors that subhumans are capable of. Indeed, it goes even further for me as it is deeply personal. My oldest son was there. I cannot be grateful enough for that he managed to escape, and I can't help but to think, had it been otherwise, otherwise, I can't find the words or the images of that sheer terror. In terrorist mind or view, we're all just faceless targets. We have no families, no feelings, we're not human. There's no value in life, and in order to fight this monster, to actually defeat this evil, we're often forced to compromise our own value system a concept that most who do not actually have to engage in combat understand, nor will they ever. Terrorism is sheer and pure violence, the ultimate evil. And it was a day that forced me to return to another life, in fact, a few other lives. And in part of these other lives, I went down to the horror to assist the security forces where I could, bringing needed equipment and continuing to stop the terrorists in the area. The actual visuals seared into my mind, the sounds, the stench, bodies, blood and ashes, and the cold rage rising in me to levels that I've never known, turning stone cold, professional, and wanting only one thing. Eventually, I returned to my studio, hoping to release some of the horror, but to no avail. I could not portray my feelings nor express them at this point. I was able to produce two works recently that reflect part of what I felt, contemporary works that touch on centuries, actually, of Jewish experiences. Anti-art, anti-Israel art after October 7th. I can't say that I was surprised by the reaction of the so-called artists, the supposed progressive, and those that identify with the political left, who almost immediately joined from their elitist and self-centered worlds, 
where their manipulated, limited views prove their bias ever so strongly. And they have ignored almost every other tragedy, not only in the world, but in their own backyards, chose ever so aggressively to attack not only the Jewish state and those that support Israel, but further adopted to support a society that is diametrically opposed to every value they have. Theirs is a fight against the same society that granted and grants them the freedom to create. Anything they deem Western is a target. In fact, if the situation was opposite, they would side with the Palestinians as they would attempt to wipe out the Jewish people. Prove it, you say? Did they side with the Palestinians as they were massacred by the Syrians? Did they stand with the Yemeni people who were massacred by the Houthis? Did they stand with the non-Muslim Sudanese as they were massacred by Muslims? And so many more examples, not a peep. Now, if that isn't bullshit straight out of directed hatred, I don't know what is. What fuels them is hatred, and now they love using that hatred against the only society where they could flourish in the Middle East, and that happens to be the Jewish state of Israel. Israeli artists who attempted to voice and present their own expressions through art were quickly targeted. God help the gallery outside of Israel that would attempt to show this work or hold a constructive discussion. Still, there are decent humans that can see through these artists' manipulated hatred and acted to keep the hatred out, only to be accused of canceling or supporting genocide. It's almost as now a war of art exists. And like in a war, there will be no true victory except for those who finance the venture. The next phase, the story continues. I've never been able to stand on the side while people are being hurt, any people. And as I mentioned, I don't like violence, but I will not shy away from it when needed. There is a conflict that exists between Israel and her enemies, and it's not a new one, obviously, but the goal has always been clear, and I choose to be on the side of Israel. I have the right to do this, to choose, just as those that are against Israel have the right to choose. I've chosen to jump fully back into my art and not back down from the haters. I will continue to try to show the beauty that I see and express some of the darker sides that I experience. I have no choice. It's who I am. And if needed, will always be available to defend my people, my land, when needed, because that is also who I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to thank... Uh Mark and Maya particularly, because I think your words are incredibly moving and also the power of the work is profound and um, courageous in this current context. So thank you both. Um, we're going to open up for questions. You ended, Mark, um, around what the current, uh, the, the, the art and culture uh, sector, uh, the publicly funded as well as um, the commercial sector, uh, have demonized. Israel uh, since the 7th of October. Um, we, uh, we recently saw the call to uh, disinvite um, Israel from the Venice Biennale uh, for the next forthcoming Biennale, um, signed by 15,000 arts workers and artists. Um, so it feels like there's an overwhelming onslaught against not only Israel, the state of Israel, but Israeli artists. Um, maybe you can share your thoughts about that. I don't think it's just against Israeli artists. I think it's against Jewish artists. And it's not just to be an alley. In New York, posters were put on art galleries everywhere. Don't work with Zionists. A friend of mine just told me that their, her gallery was just spray painted not to work with Jews. And we're seeing this all over. Now in the art world, and I'm calling this cultural terrorism, really, because that's what it is. Even in, in a demonstration, a protest regarding this event, saying, oh, they're coming here to manipulate our thoughts, to give us disinformation. I was there. I was there. My son was there. But God forbid, when I present, let's say a painting like this or the other painting that I presented, no, no, that's disinformation. And it amazes me that those who are putting it in the art world, these are the people who are putting that out? And like I mentioned, they want to support a society, and I'm not against anyone. I believe everyone has the right to believe and act how they want. These people are supporting terror. They don't know what war is, and war is the ultimate terror. 
War stinks, and this is my third war. And if you haven't gone through war, be grateful. These are the spectators, these artists from the side adopting a cause that they barely know nothing about. It's all one-sided. There's a problem in the area where I live, absolutely. How to solve it? I don't have the answer. But through conversation, through constructive conversation, I think it can be fixed. And art is one of the vehicles. And by not allowing Israeli artists or Jewish artists to express themselves, to have that freedom of expression, not only does it stop that conversation, but it brings it to another area which is bad for everybody. And that's what we're seeing going on right now. No, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, I actually was thinking about something else, uh, Mark, when you were speaking about the posters in New York. I'm not sure if the audience in Poland is aware of how the posters of kidnapped uh, people, also including children, were ripped, scratched out, from wherever they were put around the world in support for the release of hostages. And I found it deeply disturbing because you can have different opinions, um, approaches, but if you are against releasing hostages, saving life, then I think that tells me all. There's nothing to add to that. I, I want to take the opportunity, actually, and thank you, really, um, for being the first pioneers, you know, of um, in, in the arts world, as I see it today, that allow for this kind of discussion to, you know, to happen. And... Um, I think in, from a historical point of view, you know, in 10 years time, um, you're gonna look at yourselves and um, you know, you're gonna be one of these that started to change the, cur the current. Because, because it's important what we're doing now and obviously anti-Semitism have been lurking in the shadows perhaps but it's now all in the open, completely out, and it is unapologetically devastating for Jewish artists, whether they're Israelis or not. And um, you are doing something really important, Agnieszka and Manik, and um, Thank you for bringing it here. Well, thank you. Um, I have to say, and I always boast about this at every culture tensions, that these kinds of discussions will never happen in the United Kingdom um, in a publicly funded institution. Um, we believe in freedom of expression. We believe in the right for civil disagreement uh, and conversation, as Mark said. Um, and uh, you know, if there was someone here who disagrees with what we're saying, uh, we would be happy to hear that um, and um, invite uh, you know, a discussion. Um, that's what um, art is about. It's, uh, it is about um, opening, provoking um, um, thoughts and expression. That's my personal thing. But thank you so much, Maya, for your lovely words. Um, any other questions or thoughts from the public? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, just so you first, and then you next. You can speak in Polish. Uh, I can speak in English. I just wanted to express my gratitude because when I read about this um, discussion, I was so surprised because I was thinking, like in in Warsaw, in Poland, uh, it's impossible. So it's it's great to be here. It's really moving, and personally, for me, being here in Poland, 
seeing that there's opportunity to see the different point of view different that than this which is created in media it's it's great thank you very much for this thank you. i think i'm going to do it out of mic so uh, i want to record the out, because there's going to be a video after. hi so uh thank you for your time um my first thought would be um regarding what i'm sorry i don't know your name what you just said that uh, Everyone who is maybe even against what you just presented is very welcome here because that's what art is about. So my reflection is that if those who are against uh, this, whatever you name it, art perspective would contribute their time to come to such meeting instead of absorbing just titles on social media, they wouldn't be against anymore because one of the reasons is probably lack of knowledge. And um, I wonder if, uh, if art is already dividing people as well, like you just expressed. What can be the common thing, word, idea, reflection that can merge people again. Of course, business is. I come from business world and new technologies, and that's what merges people. And apparently those like dirty money and interests suddenly become something that actually can have a positive impact, so that's my reflection. But uh, you're coming from a different world, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts? And as well, the overall question that so far I haven't found one combined answer into, why the hell anti-Semitism exists? I don't think I have the answer to that one, the last. But when you mentioned how art is, is dividing, we're seeing that. In fact, we were seeing areas where all of a sudden if there was, on both sides, on both sides, and it's very important to mention that, the conversation is being stopped on both sides, whether it be a uh, Palestinian artist or pro-anti-Israel where they're making bad remarks against Israel, all of a sudden they're being claimed that they're being canceled and also with Jewish and Israeli or pro-Israeli artists. The opinions of both are being stopped. Now, in the art world, if you watch, and especially, you know, and, and I was listening to, to, to when I wasn't as aware as, as AI art as until, really until speaking with, with Maya. And everyone's trying to portray the art as who is the bigger victim. You think? Now, in war, I, I, being totally objective now, in war, the visuals are mind-blowing and of course you can produce this so you were having all these different who, who's getting more exposure and the simple fact is, is that a lot of the world chose to a lot of like I was calling them though the the progressive elites and I'm saying that cynically of course that's the art that they're trying to push more and the the controversy again is not showing our side, and God forbid to show a strong side. I come from a different mindset, and it causes controversy. I'm an outlaw in the art world, in a sense, because I defend. I'm not being political, but when I've portrayed pictures of that, it causes problems. The painting that I actually hear was... Uh, a redo, textured with gunpowder. And the grays were a lot of the ashes that I walked in, of human remains. It represents lamentations that we've been saying for years. But rather than create a show of art showing the Palestinian side, their horror, and showing the Israeli side, and making it together, no one is doing that. 
No one's continuing that conversation. And it might just be that maybe Poland and this museum might be the only place where it could get done. Maybe. But imagine that the conversations, it would be heated conversations, each side has its view. But it seems that no one, uh, no one is sticking up for that. Like I mentioned, none of the art world was, where were they? When hundreds of thousands of people were being murdered, where are they about Africa? Where are they about Syria? About Yemen? I mean, the list goes on. Where are they? And you mentioned the anti-Semitism. What gives? It's a question. I created works calling them the arena because they're just spectators. I don't know the answer about the anti-Semitism. Age old. One day. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of uh, scholarship about anti-Semitism recently. Um, you know, it's a very, very old thing. It's a very old phenomena. And I think, I think first of all, it starts from some, some type of otherness. Um, I guess the type of religion that is more um, not, it's not invited, it's kind of more secluded. Um, even though you can become Jewish, but it takes hard work to do that. Um, and then, you know, the kind of sheer degradation of, of, of this minority over the centuries. So, you know, if, if anyone should claim genocide always is Jewish people, because everywhere in the world, <laughs> the population of Jewish people have gone down. Um, and it's a fact. So, but I think there's something very strong. I mean, what Mark said about, you know, self-determination and about, I think, I think when you live with generational trauma for so many years, um, you, you just have to like stand up and just continue. You can't give up. You just have to continue and you have to integrate and you have to move all the time. You have to move countries and mm -hmm. places of work and you have to go through waves of pogroms and killings and, and you just keep surviving and we, we survived, I mean, for centuries and it's just that kind of character and I don't know whether that is a type of characteristics that really is annoying in an othered, you know, othered entity. Um, but, but we all have to remember that we are all othered. In aspects of our personality, we are othered. We are never the same. We're individuals and we have those little peculiarities and we have these things that people don't like about us or we do things that people don't like about us. And, you know, but we need to just work with it. And like Mark said, I mean, it's... You know, you can see things in life from a perspective of we're coming here to fight. You know, AI, it's something that will take artists out of jobs. And, you know, um, you can say that or you can work with AI. You can make it work. We can make it work. If we want to, we can make it work. The, 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 I think the problem is that some people are, I mean, you know, you mentioned that show that, you know, Palestinian Israeli show, you know, I would like to see that happening, but I would like to see how the other side accepts it. How do they accept discussion? Do they, will they accept discussion? I want to see that because all I see now, but then again, this, what I see now is from spectators, like you mentioned, all you see now from spectators is hate and this clinging to hate without wanting a change. 
I think it's because um, change requires work. It's very easy to hate, because you can sit you know, in your bedroom and hate all you want and go on and on, but actually when, when you have to practically think of ways how to build bridges between people, bring them together, it's hard work, and it's, a lot of times it fails, even with good intentions, so you have to also accept that, that even with good intentions, things don't, don't work, and you really have to work on yourself within the process to accept the fact that you failed and your ideals don't work in practical world. And then to see these different shades within people and yourself, because usually when you work with people and you really try to bring them together, you also see your darker sides of when you, your ego is hurt, that I had this wonderful idea and I was putting it up forward and then they don't appreciate it or they didn't do it the way I wished it to work and so on. So it's just a lot of hard work and also on yourself. And if you hate, you can project it all you want onto the others and never confront yourself in the mirror. And that's, I think, what is difficult. So there is a lot of projection. And then um, one thing that I didn't mention within my presentation in questioning the art world, I also think that unfortunately what's happened through the last 20 years is with the development of global art first, with the huge money being pumped into the art world from oligarchs, from different states that they want to whitewash themselves on the international arena. So let's say the states that support terror. They don't get their own citizens to get their hands dirty killing people, but they funnel the money for sponsoring terror abroad then they would like to pay for sports and different initiatives to, to look good in the media, to create this kind of positive media campaign. And this skews the, the art scene because we don't see the artists that either they don't want to be involved in politics at all. So let's say they love landscapes, uh, they want to I don't know, create installation, portraits, sculptures, whatever, but nothing to do with politics. They are sidelined just into the small commercial world and just fighting from day to day to sell in small galleries, or almost to their friends and so on. And then the artists that might be interested in politics, but they have a different point of view, or they question the narrative, they get sidelined, cancelled, called names, because there is a one narrative that is being uh, favored, the money is pumped into it on international level, and these are the works that have been promoted. And I have to admit that since I survived the terror attack, obviously this is something that affects me as well on a personal level, like my, my body with the post-traumatic stress disorder and then with the new terror attacks happening. I lived in London for 20 years, and since 2015 when I survived the terror attack, there were many attacks in Britain, and it was touching me to the core. So I was also looking out for things in the art world where I could have some kind of reflection or some kind of release of that through someone else even, because I got completely blocked. I just, like Mark is saying, I'm going through that phase where I'm trying to unblock myself because part of me thinks, who needs your art when this is happening and more and more and more vicious and terrible. And I couldn't find works like that in the art world going to freeze art fair year on year. And there was a po pa kind of a moment when I look at this and decided this is like a rich people's playground. They create these artworks that they look impressive and sometimes beautiful and funny, but this is like playground for kids. There's nothing of substance and seriousness. And this subject, terror, it's not there at all. They pretend it's not happening. They're putting hands over their eyes and ears and mouths. No, it, it's not here, it's not here, it's not here. And artists that would like to touch this, they sideline, they put, you know, in the basement, like, don't you dare talking about it. Any questions? Because I have one specifically for Maya. If, uh, <laughs> I, um, we had a discussion um, last year on art and artificial intelligence, and um, it's really fascinating to see how you have used the venomous online hate that you have received on social media and I witnessed um, some of that um, that you spoke about. So rather than playing the victim, you actually 
turn it around. I'd like to hear how you did that. I, I have to say, the day that I woke up to 3,800 comments on one of my um, Instagram posts, I mean, I, <laughs> the first thought I had was like, oh my God, what's going on? Um, is, are my children uns in an unsafe um, environment? You know, am I putting them in danger? Is anyone going to come in now to my house? Is anyone, go you know? And growing up in Israel, going through the Intifada, going through the uh, Gulf War, um, you know, everything is possible, you know? And after October 7th, this has become a reality that you understand that anything is possible. Um, and I, you know, it's... <sighs> The first thing I thought, actually, when I saw the 3,800 comments was that, great, they've given visibility to the post about UN women sidelining Israeli women and men that got raped during October 7th. Um, and I had three posts like that, and these were the posts that got the most vile comments from these Indonesians. Um, of course, that, w that wasn't the only one. And yes, I had a terrible day that day, and I was also very sick. And my son got stuck. I couldn't hold, get hold of him, and he's, he studies in a Jewish school. And I freaked out, and I started crying in bed, and I was hysterical, and I was, started calling the school, and I called the police, I called, you know, friends that have children in that school. Um, it makes life really complicated, this whole scenario um, of being constantly under threat. And on top of being constantly under threat, being undermined, not discussed. So they would always revert this kind of discussion into blaming other people, talking about other people and as anything to, you know, deal with what's going on, like you said. Um, and it's just devastating, really. And, you know, I just, and it took me some time to lift myself up. And I didn't know, and also, the other thing is that I always create art. And I do that with, mo with my mobile phone, a lot with my mobile phone. And... You know, I, I'm always creating, always creating. And then on the 7th of October, I just couldn't do anything. From the 7th of October until I created these works, which were about, I think, a month ago, just over a month ago, I couldn't touch anything. It was just, just being a vessel and projecting all those, you know, media, what, what I've seen on, on, on social media, like, you know, how people treat Jewish, how they rip up the, the posters, how they deny from Jewish people, you know, their dignity, their, you know, acknowledgement of what happened, the hurt, the trauma. Um, and I'm happy that I have encountered the AI, um, you know, before... October 7th, I started working with the AI, but it didn't have a substance. Um, the substance came to me, and yes, I needed to process the hate. I needed to process the hate and make it into a new material, because that makes it much easier to live with. Because I know I have a long life with this hate, and I know that you know, I don't know when it's going to get, or be over. At the moment, it looks like a really, really long, bad dream or just like, it's just, you know, you're kind of thinking, how long do I need to keep it? You know, and I know that as soon as it's going to start getting better, whenever that's going to be, a couple of years, um, I hope before, but I don't think, um, you know, we're all going to be in PTSD, like, Bad, badly. I don't know how Israelis are holding on. 
You know, I don't know how they do it. They are so brave. I cannot understand how they went through Corona, okay, wars all the time since the seventh, the, the first year of, you know, concep conception, and then, you know, war, 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 and then more war, and then Corona, and then the 7th of October, you know, they couldn't, and then, you know, the whole thing with the government, so many protests, so many issues. I don't know how Israelis do that. They're the most, they're the strongest people that I know. Mark, really, you, you, you are. No choice. There's no choice. But things will start getting better tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. Well, the people that came out here, you've seen, heard a discussion. I think there have been some positive words. And we make it better. So tomorrow, things are getting better. At least for us. <laughs> I really thank you all. And we will keep on making art. Absolutely. So some of the uh, public opinion, the positive towards Israel, is thanks to the differentiation between very violent protests pro whatever, Hamas or from the river or doesn't matter, and they are really very violent and aggressive, and um, it's hard to claim that these are like defending uh, uh, protesters. Um, when we had in Warsaw actually very nice uh, gathering pro-Israel, it was the biggest march pro-Israel that ever happened. Still, of course, it was very small because maybe it's the number that I'm pointing everywhere, so maybe for the audience uh, it will remain that uh, as well for you as artists and you might have some supporters in social media or coming to your exhibitions. So there is one billion and 500 million Muslims around the world and 15 million Jewish people. So if, yes, so if, each of them, of us, let's say, retweet a post, it's easy to understand why people are surrounded by different information that they should be. Uh, but uh, my point is that the uh, uh, protest pro-Israel uh, uh, supporting uh, Jewish, they are very calm and everyone is like arm to arm and we don't know each other but we smile to each other and we know as you Mark said that tomorrow will be a better day. It's very positive. I was wondering if maybe through art you see this powerful speech that you can bring that I understand in the first phase there is sadness yes. and hatred, but then at the end, you know, I'm attending as well a lot of electronic music festivals, similar like the one in Israel, and uh, their people as well are so positive that it's like we are, we are laughing that we are killing others with our smile, you know, and positive attitude and hope and belief that the world can be very nice and trustful place. So maybe as well through art, after some sadness uh, um, appeared, maybe the positive impact uh, can appear as well. It's, it's exactly on point, what you just said. It's extremely important, actually, what you just said. First, the parties. They have, the Israelis love these parties, yeah. and I know this from raising children. And they're always very positive and inclusive. It's not just Jews. Jews and Arabs are coming to these parties from all over the place. And the message is really peace and fixing the situation. In regards with some of the art that's been produced afterwards, you see pictures saying, we will dance again. This will bloom again. 
we're seeing that, that positive. The, the artists, the, the Israeli artists, people who are affected by this, they're saying we're going to rebuild. And they're focusing on that. Some of the images like Agnes showed in the beginning. Israelis aren't dancing when hearing about death. They're not dancing and they're not happy about what's going on in Gaza. But of course that, that doesn't get through to people, but it's absolutely showing itself in the art world. We are seeing people are trying to put out positive images. We'll wrap up there, Mark. I think that's really important about um, the sanctity of life and the joy of life and the lust for life. Um, which I think resounds far more than any other form of the kind of nihilistic hate that we have seen um, uh, uh, on, on, on the other side, um, often as we've seen with Agnieszka's images. Thank you all so much.